What's up, y'all? It's Shuffle. It's time for the Grave Robber Guide. I've been teasing it for a while since last summer. The reason it hasn't come until now is because I've actually recorded it a few different times, and I didn't like how it came out. Each of those times, either the commentary wasn't that good, or I needed more footage, or something that didn't, didn't work right the way I wanted it to, or I get into editing, and I didn't like what it looked like. So now, we're just gonna go back, and hopefully have all the kinks ironed out, and we're gonna talk about the freaking Grave Robber. So there's a lot to talk about. I was thinking maybe the video should just be like 15-20 minutes, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to get everything in, in that time. Which means, we're just going to talk. We're going to go through all the notes I have. I'm going to give y'all my thoughts, my strengths, weaknesses, stuff like that. Anything that I think is relevant, and teams, and setups. I'm going to be focusing on the Grave Robber, but in the purpose of teams, I feel like I should explain some of the the choices for you know uh, loadouts and items and things like that which kind of steps on the other idea of class guides so there's gonna be some overlap so I hope you bear with me and let's see where are we starting so I have a huge thing of notes off screen right now I have about two pages written for the grave robbers so we're gonna start at the general stuff before going into the specifics I'm not going to break down each individual move and stuff like that as I did in the tier list video, so if you want to go watch that, The Grave Robber is in part 2 near the end, I think. I should make timestamps, note to self. But anyway, we are going to do a bit of an overview and stuff like that, so... After burying the lead for like a minute... Alright. Strengths. What is The Grave Robber good at? She is evasive. She is fast. She is the fastest base character in the game without, you know, quirks and stuff like that. She is versatile. Even though she's a damage dealer, she has multiple ways to do her damage. She has fantastic personal trinkets. Probably my favorite part. And she brings a shovel, which you're kind of like, what? But think about it like this. The shovel item is used in almost every dungeon. It doesn't matter the region. And it's not for curio, which, you know, most curio you can go, I don't really want this. If you're just feeling whatever and you don't want to take the risk and you can just skip it, but the shovel needs to get rid of blockages. It opens a couple curio in different spots, but specifically it has to get rid of blockages, and most of the time there's no way around it. A lot of the pathing in dungeons doesn't give you secondary routes, and if you have to dig through it by hand, it causes a lot of stress and stuff like that, so we don't want to do that. So Grave Robber brings a shovel. Shovel's the most expensive base item, I believe, at 250. Unless there's some at 300, I can't remember. Shovel's very good. There's another notable advantage to the Grave Robber, and here you people out there, you're like, Shuffle, we're playing on low light or no light. You know, Grave Robber gets two tapped. What's going on? It's like, true, I hear you, but check this out, right? So the Grave Robber also gets a lot of access to scouting, so her, my opinion, her best trinket, the Rager's Talisman, gives extra scouting, and then also she has a camp skill that gives her scouting, so in lower light levels, when surprises are more prevalent, uh, scouting is how you offset that. So for any player that doesn't know, you can't be surprised if you scouted the battle. So like, if you go a room, you scout, you see a fight coming, you will not be surprised by it. You may not surprise them, but you won't be surprised by it, which means the biggest killer, or one of the biggest killers in higher difficulty, like low light and stuff, is when your team gets surprised and they get scrambled and then people just get like slapped in the wrong positions, you know? Like your back lines go up to the front, they can't do anything, or your leopard goes to the back, that kind of stuff. Um, by having extra scouting, the Grave Robber is able to help deal with that and mitigate it pretty pretty substantially, you know, like, I think the baseline scouting chance is 25% without quirks and stuff, and then with the Raider's Talisman, which is pretty easy to get, you can just kill a boss early on, your scouting, your baseline scouting is already up to 40% than any other, like, Ruin Scrounger, Wield Explorer, those kinds of things, or Ancestor's Map, like, you can get your scouting over 50% pretty easily with her, or like, at 50%, I should say, uh, if you have, like, one other person that can bring it, so... Scouting, really good reason to bring her. Weaknesses, she has backline damage. When I say backline damage, this one's in the sanitarium right now. Backline damage is this right here, the 7 to 14 base damage. The reason it's called backline damage is because most other people have that thing, right? 7 to 14, your backliners. Well, this one's got minus 10%, but your back... What the hell, dude? Thank you, I was gonna say. So, a lot of your not specific rank 1, rank 2 damage dealers have this 7 to 13 or 7 to 14 thing, right? So, Grave Robber has backline damage, which kind of sucks when you are a damage dealer, especially when you have, like, melee skills. But she, has that, uh, but she does have armor pens, so that is something to note. Anyway, 
She does get bonus damage on some of her stuff, but it is not as high as something like the Arbalest, for instance. Sniper shot on Mark is double damage plus crit. Fantastic. Uh, her stuff, like Throne Dagger, doesn't get as fat of a uh, damage bonus, but kind of the saving grace is she gets damage from two sources. So Mark or Blight. Usually Blight is the one you want just because Blight is extra damage, and actually we'll explain why that 33% is closer to something like 60 in a second here. You can probably figure it out for yourself, but we will go through it just in case. When I say she's fragile, I'm very serious. 36 base HP. A lot of people use this as a negative against her, and it is a negative, but they go, oh, she just gets like one tapped, which is largely not true, but we also have to look at... Why do you have... You both have... Oh, 10%. Okay. So... Without the District for Houndmaster, for instance, which is a character that most people universally agree on is really good, either S or A tier, depending on who's doing a list, uh, they never really talk about the Houndmaster having just one extra hit point over the Grave Robber. So, like, a lot of the times when they discuss Grave Robber, for some reason this weakness only applies to her, even though several other characters have lower HP values, right? So we have a lot of people that are sub-40. And Shieldbreaker, who <laughs> many people were screaming at me to uh, bump up in the tier list when I made the first set of videos before I made part 4. Again, 36 base. You know, she gets a district, which is good. But districts aren't easy to get. In most playthroughs, especially if you're doing like Blood Moon, you're on the clock, you're on the time limit, so you usually only get a couple districts, like maybe three. You gotta pick and choose. You know, if you want to buff up your Shield Breaker and your Houndmaster and stuff like that just to give him four hit points, that's fine, but her hit point deficit isn't as big of a deal as people make out. And again, we'll go through why in a second, but it's a negative that she has that she shares with other people, but for some reason people only talk about it with her, so I think that's usually a little blown out of proportion. And I've said before that this is going to be my defense of the Grave Robber, because a lot of people have been saying, Grave Robber A tier? Are you serious? Like... Top 5 character? Do you mean that shuffle? And it's like, yeah. So I'm talking about why. You know, I've argued it in the comments, but... This is the video talking about it. The... Big thing that a lot of people run into, in terms of a negative, is the team has to respect her moving around, in most cases. If you want to do the Shadow Fade and Lunge combo, which is, in fact, her bread and her butter, the team has to be able to operate when she's in... the starting position, where she's about to Shadow Fade, and then... It has to be able to operate after she is shadow faded. So, just a easy example is if she starts out in rank 2, she's usually going first because she's so fast in most cases, and then she shadow fades here. Your team has to be able to operate in both of these situations. And I guess I should talk about terminology because I forget these things, but when we talk about ranks, ranks are considered, or it's the name for positioning in Darkest Dungeon, so. From the player side, rank 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it goes the other way for the monsters, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So, front line is 1, 2, back line is 3, 4, just so we all know before I forget. And your team has to be able to operate in both instances of her doing this. That is like the minimum requirement if you want to use Shadow Fade Lunge. You can just throw her in, I always do this, you can just throw her in the back and just like throw daggers over and over, you can leave her here, and there's a couple builds for that and then you don't have to really worry about it, but the movement part of her is something I think that, again, people kind of overreact to. Like, you only need... There are a lot of characters, okay? There are a lot of characters that you can leave them... Your frontliner up here, this could be... If you want to use your Leper or your Hellion or whatever, that can just be up here. And then your next two characters just have to be able to operate like this. And one of the team examples that I'm going to go over has an Abomination and a Vestal, right? So, your Abomination and your Vestal or your Occultist or whoever you want to use in the back as a healer, potentially. Both of these characters can, op like, can operate in both of these spots. So, if, for instance, if uh, Abomination's here, he can use everything that he wants to. He can transform, he can move up, he can can't use Rake, but you can switch positions here. You have ways to move around. Uh, otherwise, these things too 
Don't really have to worry about positioning. Vestal can use... This is, in my opinion, her best loadout. You can use that in 3 and 4, which I just had backwards right there, but... Otherwise, it's pretty easy to... manipulate the team around the Grave Robber, so you don't have to... get this idea where, well, if my Grave Robber's jumping all over the place, I need, like... You know, a freaking a highwayman doing like duels advance and point blank and shield breaker, which moves all over the place, which this is a team I use, but you don't have to do all that and then have like someone in the fourth and just have this crazy like rearrangement of people like this. Like you can do it. It's usually more trouble than it's worth. But again, you don't have to have this crazy dancing team to make the Grave Robber effective. You just need a team that can function when she's in point A and point B. So there you go. Her speed is a weakness in a couple ways, surprisingly. She's too fast to take advantage of being set up unless you use Shadow Fate on turn one. So if you want to use things that give her, um, let's see, you know, Blight for bonus damage or Mark for Throw Dagger or Blight, whatever you're doing, she can't do that on turn one because she's just so fast, so she's going to go before your setup person most of the time. So that's why she has Shadow Fade. Shadow Fade, if you had, don't know what it does, if you haven't seen it, I forgot to explain it since it's a really good move. Uh, she gets stealth for two turns, but she comes out of stealth when she attacks. And you get, obviously, a fat damage bonus, fat crit bonus, and then the dodge bonus actually lasts for, I think, four rounds. It lasts for multiple rounds. So it carries over to her next turn, which is relevant because this means that when she shadow fades and she goes into stealth, she's completely protected unless it's a group attack, and then she attacks and goes up front or lunges or throws daggers or whatever happens and she comes out of stealth, but then she has dodge for the next turn to protect herself a little bit longer. So it's a really good um, mode of play and she does take care of herself a little bit more than you'd expect her to. So usually if you want to do some setup, which I think is the best way to use her, you should Shadow Fade on turn 1, so always put her either in rank 2 or rank 1, and the goal is to Shadow Fade back here. There are some tricky setups with the, the Shadow Fade and the Lunge and stuff like that, where you can have her, for instance, like Shadow Fade all the way back here, and then Lunge, and then whoever's in, this is just a random person, whoever's in slot 3 has a movement skill, goes after her, and then she can Lunge a second time, like that. That kind of stuff you can do, it's a little tricky. I don't like to set that kind of stuff up, it's usually more trouble than it's worth. I'd rather just blight and then lunge and then shadow fade and set up a second time. There's one more thing you have to push back on. I've been hearing this a lot when I see grave robber chatter and stuff like that. People say like, oh well, her speed's actually a detriment because what if she's like really hurt and she gets to death's door and then has a bleed and then her turn comes first and the healer can't get her and she just drops dead. Oh! Uh. It's like, I mean, yeah, sure, but that can happen to literally any character. Okay. So in Darkest Dungeon, when you lose characters, it's usually you made some critical error, which does happen. Or, the more common way, is there's just a series of, like, unfortunate events. Like, Lemony Snicket, or whatever his name is, shows up. And it's like, my speed got, you know, messed up or something. Like, my turns came out of order, this person crit me, the bleed also hit me, and then my turns came out of order again, and then I missed the one in three to survive Death's Door and then died. Like, that. that's a lot of things that have to happen. It's not this thing where she gets hit once, and it's a crit for like 25, and then someone crits her for 12 and bleeds her, and then she's a death door, and then her turn comes like next and she just drops dead. Like that, like that, that can happen, but that is, it's as rare for her as it is for anyone else, right? So when people point that out, it's like, it's like a targeted detriment in, in like a vacuum where people aren't looking at all the other stuff going on. So for that to happen, for her to get like double crit or crit and then bleed, and then her turn comes up and then she bleeds out. You have to think about the rest of your team, right? Oftentimes, you have four versus four, so you got your, your party against their party kind of thing. That means that the enemy turns have to come as such that it sets that up. And then what is the rest of your team doing in that moment? You know, like who's not stunning the person that can bleed? Who's not uh, hitting a heal? Who's not dropping a cure or whatever? Like there's, you have 
like you have at least one or two chances to try and disrupt that if like you're so scared of that like if you go oh man this thing just you know i forgot to stealth and <laughs> i got crit for 20 like let's say you're in the cove it's like that stupid blue fish which is basically the cove leopard hit me really hard and then i got arterial pinched or something it's like this isn't even considering guard like there's so many things you can do in that moment and then you still have to lose the the two and three for the death blow so like if all that happened I mean, most of the time there's something you could have done, and there's also, uh, you know, just the unfortunateness, if that's even a word, of, like, bad RNG, that all those things just lined up at the same time. So, I don't want to hear that, I know people are going to say it, or they've said it to me, I don't want to see that in the comments, I don't want to see, well, her speed's actually a detriment, because if you have three bad instances of RNG, she could actually die before the healer gets to do anything. It's like, that could happen to anyone. And by that logic, like, if speed is suddenly not a great stat, like, speed is arguably the most important stat. And, like, if speed is suddenly not a good stat, that means the Crusader's the best character. Oh, God, what? He's got, like, one speed. That means the Crusader always gets to respond. He's never caught off guard. Like, there's no unfortunate... Like, no, dude. Like, that's the other thing. Like, if you're so worried about that, just put a Crusader in the team. As you know, Crusader can heal from any rank, and he's guaranteed to go last most of the time, so if you're really worried, there you go. <laughs> yeah, my point with this is that's just the same, uh, it's just calling out how there's, like, this weird double, I don't want to say double standard, but, like, it's this paradox that people just create for themselves, where it's like, oh, she's really fragile, okay, well, she can stealth, oh, if she's stealth, that means your other characters get hit, and, like, they get focus fire, it's like, well, you don't want her to get hit, so what's what's the deal? Oh, her speed's really bad because it can actually kill her. It's like, that's the only situation it does, too. It has to be a damage over time effect. She has to be put to death's door. And then her turn has to come up and she has to lose. But like I said, that can happen to anyone. It can literally happen to any character. You're left with, is speed good or bad? You know, if you say it's good, then you can't, you can't really say that. It's just uh, an unfortunate circumstance of RNG, so. Ah, I, I feel like those points were big and had to... Uh, had to be addressed. I think the reason most people don't like her or don't want to use her that much is just because dancing teams do take a little work to figure out and even if you have one person moving around I guess you could call it a dancing team or something like that but she's like a dancer and a setup at the same time so you're trying to do two different things which means you have to really consider your team what's it doing on turn one what's it doing on turn two it's not just like I put my arbalest and I drop her speed with a bracer and then I have a bounty hunter that presses mark and then I shoot them, you know. You actually have to think, what am I doing turn one? What am I doing turn two? If you have a super movement heavy team, which, as I said before, I had the... I had this combination. And I had a shield breaker. Too many people in the roster. So, like, a team like this, you really have to think... What does turn one look like? What does turn two look like? And then what does turn three look like? Because it takes three turns usually for this team to reset into this position. So you really have to uh, plan ahead. And a lot of people just don't want to do that, I think. And I will say this, if you do make a mistake in your dancing team, like if you don't have the speeds in the proper ranges, like you haven't accounted for them to where people are consistently going in a certain order, like turn one and then turn two, and then turn three, like, if you don't manipulate your speeds as such to where that happens, for instance, uh, you're pretty screwed, like, the moment you get into a fight, unless you start swapping skills around, so you really have to plan. And I guess that's the big thing with the Grave Robbers, you have to plan, you have to think. You have to, uh, have a little foresight. As a character, camping isn't a huge deal for her. There are some characters, like the Arbalest, the Man-at-Arms, uh, you could argue the Highwayman, for instance, they just actually jump in terms of effectiveness if they're allowed to camp. Certain characters don't really need that, like the Vestal, it doesn't really matter if she gets to camp, and the Grave Robber's in that camp, <laughs> for lack of a better word. She's a character that she doesn't need to camp in order to get stuff done. Her best camp skills are probably the Scouting, the Night Moves right here, and Snuffbox is really good if you get double disease, so always consider that. Usually pretty good in the Warrens, because those spitting pigs usually drop one or two diseases during a run. Gallows humor is okay. Like, sometimes it can low roll and you just hate life, but even the penalty's not that bad, so still pretty good camp skill. But she doesn't need any of these to get really good. Right, that's what I'm trying to get out here. So, like, the, uh, we'll just use the man at arms because he's right here. Like, man at arms wants to camp, and man at arms wants to hit tactics. Man at arms wants to hit potential instruction on your, you know, hyper carry, damage dealer, or weapons practice. Like, man at arms wants to camp desperately and press these buttons. And Grave Robber just doesn't have to do that. So that's kind of a strength, and that's kind of a weakness at the same time. 
a lot of the harder missions in the game have camping, so like boss missions or some of the darkest dungeon missions. And the fact that she doesn't get to camp kind of limits her, so always consider that. It's so like I said, it's not a strength, but it's also not a weakness. Her district, we go back to the, the Hamlet. Her district, if I can remember which one it is, it's like the yellow hand, right? Yeah. So her district is actually really good. 4% crit, 5% scouting. Uh, the best thing about her is probably her scouting. That's like the best thing she brings to the party besides her raw damage. So this is a really good thing to use if you like your rogue types, and you're doing your Blood Moon or whatever playthrough, and you're like, what district should I get next? And you like your Grave Robber and these other two classes, definitely get this. So her district, really solid. Grave Robber is good in all regions. She's good in the Darkest Dungeon. She's good in the four base regions. She's probably limited here just because the attritional aspect of the fight, but I don't think Shadow Fade has a limited use now, so. She can still do okay here. Courtyard, pretty good actually. A lot of the, what is it? A lot of the enemies, like the most threatening enemies in the courtyard usually have no prot, so it's like the, I forget their actual names, but like the noble men and women. They have about like 35 HP or something like that, and a lunge can usually take one of those down, but the blight resistance in there kind of hampers her. Otherwise, you're looking for either you want blight synergy, so she can lunge at it, or you want her for her armor piercing, because she's the only other character that has baseline armor piercing besides uh, the shield breaker. There you go. So she has a different couple things she can do. She can be used in cleave comps, which we'll talk about later. This move is actually surprisingly good. And if you want to do heavy blight teams against someone that has potentially low blight resist or they have multiple turns. So if you can get like, for instance, the Fnatic or uh, any other boss that has multiple turns and you can weaken them enough on their blight resist to just stick this, she can put out a lot of damage with this, especially with her uh, Farmstead Trinket, I believe. If I remember correctly. Actually, I'm going to tab out real quick just to see if I remember what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, I had it right. The... Farmstead Trinket does have increased blight duration, so that makes it really good. So if you need to just bleed someone out really hard, there you go. So this next part is in response to a lot of common criticisms I hear about Grave Robber, both things I've seen in other videos because I do do my research, but then also things people have said to me when they think the Grave Robber's not good, like why do you think she's that good, that kind of thing, so. There have been some changes that have actually made her a lot better than people think, and they've actually helped her, and I think people have just kind of slept on it. And it's actually surprising. There are a lot of times where people say, like, oh, I used to like the Grave Robber, but then, like, the nurse hit her or something like that. Or they go, the reason I don't think she's that good, you know, I've never tried Shadow Fade. Maybe I need to try that. So just those things. And I think that the core of the character at this point in the game is Shadow Fade. So if you're not shadow fading, she's going to feel like not that good or half a character. And to be fair, I'm not trying to call people out for that. You know, when I was playing the game for the longest time, I was the same way. I thought the Grave Robber wasn't that good because I never used shadow fade. Back in the day, when you look at my, my blind let's play of the game, I played it like right after the game was released. So there was no stealth mechanic and a lot of other changes came through later. Some of the ones we're going to be talking about, but like after the Color of Madness patch, and the introduction of the stealth mechanic, uh, the Grave Robber's actually gotten a lot better, I feel like. And if you're not using Shadow Fade with her, try and use Shadow Fade with her and see if that changes your opinion, because I feel like that's pretty much the best way to operate the character now. You know, she does damage in multiple different ways, and it can kind of feel like she's spread thin or whatever, but I think if you're Shadow Fading and using specific moves, she's good. And you don't even have to lunge, you can just Shadow Fade and then hit other stuff, which we'll talk about, but... Definitely Shadow Fade. I guess that's the whole point of the video. Please press Shadow Fade. Maybe I'm going to name that the video. Who knows? So for as fragile as she is, she has Shadow Fade. And because of Shadow Fade, obviously she's in stealth, which means she cannot be targeted. Unless it's a group attack that targets multiple things, which that can happen. But usually when you stealth, you are pretty safe. And also her speed lets her go first. So she is able to defend herself with Shadow Fade. That's why it's such a good skill. It literally does everything. And then there's this weird catch-22 that people, this, this paradox that people try and put on me. They go, well, she's really fragile and she can, you know, die really easily. Okay, well, she has Shadow Fade. But then that makes the enemy attack all your other people in the party and they get focus fire. And it's like, well, what do you want? Either she's too fragile and she has to defend herself or she can't defend herself because other people get hit, you know? So I don't, I don't think those are 
valid comparisons. Like, anyone talking about her defensive issues just has to realize she has Shadow Fade. And if you really want to, you can have a team where she can Shadow Fade, go into Stealth, and then when she comes out of Shadow Fade, someone can stun the people that are going to be attacking her next. Like, if she Shadow Fades and then lunges, you can have a Hellion that stuns everything on turn two. Like, the, the two frontliners with, uh, yeah. So it's very easy to play around her stealth and when she's going to get hit. Like, it's no secret when she's vulnerable, you know? It's not just the enemy decides to focus fire her. It's like, well, she doesn't have stealth this turn, so I gotta be aware of that. And it's really easy to play around, so she has really good defenses, actually, besides her Junko HP. The biggest change, also, for the Grave Robber besides Shadow Fade that I think most people don't consider, maybe they just didn't know about it, but the hit cap has been changed from 90% to 95 which means that in darkness against the Grave Robber's base dodge, almost no enemy is hit capped against her. So that means her dodge actually comes into play, and even with the bonus 12.5% chance to hit in darkness, uh, Grave Robber still comes out to like, I don't know, like 3 or 5% dodge against even the highest accuracy things. There might be a couple outliers that I can't remember, but most moves have, like, at champion level, have about 102% base accuracy or like 107. If you look at the wiki, which is a great place to get information, by the way, please do that. Uh, long story short, her dodge does come into play there, and then she's got trinkets that give her extra dodge, and Shadow Fate gives her dodge. So with, let's say, a Lucky Talisman and Shadow Fade, at max rank, Shadow Fade gives 15% dodge. So she would have an extra, uh, what is that, 25 on top of the 30, so she has 55% chance to dodge baseline before most other things happen if she gets to go first and Shadow Fade, so any other dodge on top of that is good, so dodge is not as bad as it once was. These two things along with the Shadow Fade change actually did help her defensively uh, quite a bit, so I don't know how to wrap up that statement, but uh, numbers. So I am assuming this is the heart and soul of this video, which are team comps because people like team comps. This is my favorite comp for Grave Robber. Comp is short for composition, just in case you don't know. Uh, but the reason is, it can be played a couple different ways, but I like it with Lunge. So if you look here, we have Shadow Fade and Lunge. These are the core abilities of this. I would say this is your best third ability, and then you can pick something else for fourth, but I still think that Poison Darts is the best fourth, and we'll talk about why. So, also I think it's funny it says, like, preferred target. Like, when it says preferred target, this is just showing you what you can reach. Not so much what the preferred target is. Preferred targets are these. Or the back two. But these are what you can reliably reach the easiest with your, your loadout. The other supporting actors, we have Abomination because we have a very nice Bile. Not Bile. It's called Bile, but Blight attack that hits rank 2 and 3. Rank 3 is usually really squishy, and Grave Robber can just dumpster that with the help of this. And then, I just got text, but then we have Hellion with some other stuff, and then we have probably the best Vestal loadout, which is just a straight healer with a stun. So, turn one, you Shadow Fade. You Spit Bile. You Iron Swan, most likely. We'll talk about contingencies, or what is it, stipulations in a second here. And then turn two, you Lunge. You're looking pretty good. So, the reason we choose these moves is we need Shadow Fade and Lunge because Shadow Fade protects the Grave Robber. We like the damage bonus. It's going to erase whoever it hits like 99% of the time. Without crit, it hits for like 30, maybe higher than that. When it crits, I, I, the highest I've seen is like 84. So, <laughs> that's really nice. And... I was losing my place. Okay, I was talking about the Grave Robber moves. Alright. So we have, or we have Shadow Fade to protect her. All the damage bonus is nice, but it stealths her for two turns. It gives her dodge for four turns. So when she comes out of stealth, it's more protection for her. So we like that. Throw Dagger. This reaches the most enemies. It gives us the biggest coverage. And it still has Blight Synergy. We like that. We have Poison Darts. This is where you can make your own choice of fourth move. I would say you need these three. You can even Shadow Fade into Throw Dagger if you want. Because sometimes there's just those weird rolls of enemy comps and you're like, I don't want to lunge up to the front. 
it would be smarter if I just throw a dagger for like 25 damage, plus more with blight and stuff, so that is okay. The reason we take poison darts as our fourth move, you could arguably take any of these. We take poison darts because we want to leave Hellion in rank one, so she can iron swan. Sometimes she needs to iron swan a second time, or whatever. Completely cool. Uh, and then this way... Sorry, my brain just collapsed on itself right there, so... <laughs> yeah, so we leave Hellion up front because she can Iron Swan. I forgot about this, she gets Battle Trance. And uh, both of those are really good for her damage. Iron Swan just kills things. And then we have this. We like Battle Trance almost as good as Sharpened Spear. It's hard to say which is better. I don't know how the math comes out on that. I would say Sharpened Spear might still be better, but just in case, right? We get the Outsider Bonfire. Very cool. So yeah, we want Hellion up front. That's that's the thing. So that leaves out Pick to the Face, because we can't use it at the back. Uh, flashing Daggers, probably the runner-up to Poison Dart, and that's because this team has a lot of impromptu cleave options. So you have this, which can hit the two middle things. This hits the two front things. This hits the front three things. So you can kind of have this weird cleave thing going on if you really want to, but... This is probably still not as good as Poison Dart because the thing at the front is the most likely to have armor or protection, whatever you want to call it. And if we're going to not be using pick, we need something to get through armor and this works. The reason we also like this is because this uh, is a slower killer. You know, in the immortal words of the Ancestor and Wayne June and all that, the, uh, the slow and insidious killer. But, or Death by Inches and all those those quotes, I'm starting to ramble on here. But we like this because we have a lot of stuns on the team. So if you want to, we can start stacking Blight and then stun and then start spamming recovery moves. So this team can milk an extra turn or two where the enemy can't do anything as it's bleeding out from poison damage. And you have two people that are able to recover. Actually, if you use Adrenaline Rush too, this is another small heal, right? So there's a lot of stuff you can do. So that's all cool. Uh, cool? Cull? Cool. Shripping over my own words. Uh, for Toxin Trickery, I don't like it that much because I want my damage dealer, if they're skipping a turn, I want them to be giving themselves damage. So people say this to me a lot. They go, well, when you Shadow Fade, you just do nothing. No, Shadow Fade does a lot of things. You're protecting yourself, that's the biggest thing. It's a huge defensive move. But then you're giving yourself extra damage when you come out of stealth. So it's just a lot of bursts, it's a lot of damage, it has the potential to high roll, uh, which you don't really call a mega positive, but like you're sitting around how much crit, right? So this is with, uh, so we have the building, which is 2%. And we have 5% from this. So that's an extra 7% on top of our base, 10. And what's the quirk? Clutch hitter? Yeah, this isn't in effect, so. So we are at 17% chance to crit. And then this goes up to 29 with lunge. And then this is 37 with shadow fade. And uh, well, we don't have another crit bonus, so. 37% chance to crit, pretty good, so. Solid chance right there. And you look here, a lot of the other buffs that we can justify using on our damage dealers give them damage. So Shadow Fade gives damage. So it makes sense that this doesn't give damage because then you're just getting a bunch of damage from extra sources and then the Grave Robber is just ridiculous. But we're okay skipping a turn to Adrenaline Rush. Like compare Adrenaline Rush to, to, uh, to Toxin Trickery. So they're both curing Blight and Bleed. This one gives you a little dodge and some extra speed, which is all nice. This heals hit points, and this gives damage and accuracy. Because her accuracy is okay. A little more is always nice. So this does a lot of things. I'm okay skipping this turn to do that. I'm okay skipping a turn to revenge on the leper. I'm okay setting those up, you know? Uh, so, Trickery, probably the worst fourth choice, if you're going to do that. And I've talked about that too much now. So, those are your skills. The rest of your team, we take this setup here. You can use If It Bleeds if you're not playing in no torch runs because there's less chance of surprise. I take Breakthrough because 
If you're playing in darkness, there's a bigger chance to get surprised, and this helps you fix positioning. The debuff does kind of suck, but, you know, we gotta be able to fix ourselves without just pressing move, because that's like one of the lowest impact plays to have. We have Wicked Hack, just because her, uh, her base damage is good, and it hits the front. We have Iron Swan, this is usually your turn one move, if you don't get surprised, because... Her crit chance can get up to the same thing, about 35-40%, so she has a chance to one-tap the backliner. Plus, she has pretty high base damage, and the backline is the most squishy one, so we like this. There's a lot going on here. This might be Hellion's best move. It's between that and Yop, most likely. Uh, but yeah, this gives us some coverage. This is usually your turn one, unless, unless the two frontliners go before Hellion. I know it sounds kind of weird to think about. If the two frontliners don't have their turns, like if they've already gone, then you want to stun on turn one. And the reason being, when the Grave Robber lunges back up, and she's out of stealth, you want the frontline to be stunned. So sometimes there's this thing where the Hellion goes first, and you Iron Swan, and you're happy, and then turn two rolls around, and uh, the two frontliners go before Hellion, and you don't get a stun. That's when we're relying on dodge. But that's not mega common. You know, sometimes it's like one of the frontliners, but it's not usually both. Okay. So, otherwise, you're going to Iron Swan. And then turn two, you're going to Yop if everything goes well. And after that, it's pretty much like Wicked Hack and Stun Rotation while you try and like milk extra heals. So, some okay sustain here. And as I said, if you are not uh, in darkness, so surprise is less common. You can use this instead of Breakthrough. The reason being because you can just start hitting things with Bleeds. And there's no penalty to this besides the, the flat damage penalty. But it's not like this. Where it, uh... What is it? It gives her a debuff afterwards. So. The reason I don't use this either is because this is a Blight team. There's a lot of Blight synergy. And I'd rather just hit the thing in the front. You could use this, but usually things are resistant to Blight or Bleed. It's not both. So if you're fighting things that are weak to Blight, you're not going to have a chance to bleed them. The Abomination gets to use all of his moves. That's pretty cool about him, if you didn't know. So we're going to be spamming this and this. We're going to be rotating the two of them. So you're going to be doing Blight and stuns throughout the whole fight. You'll transform if you need to. If you're fighting like a Shambler, you're going to transform and start hitting Rake. Or some of the other moves. And then you have heals and stuff like that. So it's pretty much these two. Again, we're just trying to, like, do a controlled burn. We burst damage, like, the first two turns, and then we just uh, let them die to poison and stuns the next, like, two turns so we can just spam heals. That is probably the easiest description of this team. I don't know why I closed that. And then, as I said before, this is the best Vestal loadout, IMO. You get a stun, you get an okay damage move, you get a bunch of heals. If the Vestal needs to heal herself, uh, hit Judgment if their evasion isn't super high. Like, if you have about a 75% chance to hit or higher, just tap Judgment on something. Like, this is more... This is like a higher tempo move if you know your, uh... What is it, like, your card game terms? So, otherwise, you got these, which is cool. And... Trinkets. We're looking at the letter opener, if you can get it, just because it's really good for lunge. Uh, Raider Salisman, this is like the core of all the Grave Robber builds, I feel, just because it covers so many things. And if I didn't say it in the video already, you get it from the Warrens. So consider that. Go kill one of the Warrens bosses early when the Raider Salisman shows up. Pick it up. We like that. The Hellion is going to use a hairpin, depending on which light level you play in. So if you play over 75%, use a Heavens. If you play under 70 or 25%, use a Hells. The debuffs on the Hell's Hairpin aren't mega, mega big. Well, the debuffs, I guess the penalties, right? So the debuff resist, the bleed resist does kind of suck. Because there's a lot of bleed in the game. But there you go. You could also argue putting it in, or putting this in instead. So you'd use a stun amulet or the stupid brass elephant. Because this thing is just, I don't know how you design the rest of the stun charms when this thing exists. Because this thing is just a power creeping mofo or like it limits design space so if you want a higher chance of stun consider that otherwise there's other stuff you can use like any defensive charm could be second like a uh 
Yeah, like if you're not using, what is it? If it bleeds, not if it bleeds. God, what is it now? What's the bleed move? I just had it. Oh, it is if it bleeds. Oh, that's bleed out, okay. So yeah, if you're not using one of those, then this could be pretty good. Book of Sanity, Focus Ring if you want extra damage, or like a box. There's so many things you could slap here. Like even this, right? I like this because it gives speed and uh, death blow. The bleed chance, if I decide to use bleed, is fine. But otherwise, that's pretty nice. There's a lot of things you can use there. You could use, like I said, defensive charm or trinket. Um, something that's supportive, right? There's a lot of stuff you can put there. So your options are open. The abomination, I think, needs the padlock of transference for this build, just to make sure that our stun and blight, uh, blight chances are good and everything sticks. And then something that boosts accuracy just in case he has to uh, transform. But also, it's never bad to have a little more accuracy. Sometimes, like, things are really evasive. You know, like the Crimson Court Mosquitoes, they're pretty evasive. They go fast, but also Abomination has some pretty good speed, so he might go first. And sometimes you don't want to blight those things. You want to go first and then hit stun. And having some kind of accuracy booster helps us there. And then whatever else you can get on top of it. So, like, you could use a Moon Ring. Or something, for instance, that wouldn't be too bad. But a lot of options there. Same thing as the Hellion too. If you're not too worried about your accuracy, you can start using some defensive stuff to give them a little more. Where's the uh, Flesh Heart's also good. Flesh Heart's just a really good trophy. Yeah. The Vestal. This is also the fastest Vestal you ever see in your life. I don't know why I lock both these in, <laughs> but. Like, if I found, like, Hippocratic, I'd lock that in for sure, but that's something else. Uh, if you don't know Hippocratic, I think that's the one I'm thinking of, where it boosts, like, healing by 20%, just absolutely godlike on a Vestal. So if you can get that, grab it. Um, let's see. The Trinkets. I like the Salacious Diary over... Or the Ancestor Scroll, both those are good. Like, this is easier to get than the Salacious Diary, because there's no guarantee you're going to get this. But you're guaranteed to get this thing at some point, so... Ancestor Scroll, if you get it early, is pretty nice. Sacred Scroll, I can't remember if this comes from everywhere, I think it does. But if it doesn't, then just, you know, go to that zone, try and hunt it down. Uh, this is an okay choice for Healing Trinket. The reason I don't like it so much is the minus damage and the minus uh, stun skill chance. Because I feel like, for some reason, the minus 10% on this, whatever it is, for some reason, that minus 10% seems to screw me more often than not. So I don't like using it. I'm just like, I feel like I'm being superstitious about it. Uh, but then also the minus damage on the, the Sacred Scroll, the minus 33% damage is kind of garbage. So I don't think this puts us to zero. But it's definitely like one or two damage. And then Judgment actually does okay damage, even with the penalty on it. So I don't want to lower her damage any more than it is. So that's why I want a Salacious Diary, because this is 25% healing, not as strong as 33%, but there's no downside. So if you get lucky, grab that. Otherwise, as I was saying before, the Ancestor Scroll, pretty good, but then you have some like potentially two things with double stress. That can get out of control pretty quickly. Otherwise, there's, I think there's a blue charm that does healing, I can't remember, but then there's this thing. This is somewhat easy to get early, just it has to show up obviously, but you have a okay chance. Like when you start doing uh, medium link missions or you start doing, what's the second one? Veteran? Yeah, veteran missions. Then this will start showing up and this is okay. 15% healing, that does give her like another break point, so like plus one or two on her group heal, and then like two or three, potentially, eh, probably one, plus one <laughs> on her, uh, her single target healing. It's not bad, right? So that's okay. And then her second trinket should be something supportive. I like the Ancestors map just because it gives us a ton of extra scouting on top of the Grave Robber's Raider Salesman. So your base chance to scout is 25%. Raider Talisman up to 40. Ancestor's Map up to 65. That's pretty good. Especially if you're playing in 
Darkness, where surprise is more common and scouting becomes more valuable than it already is, plus scouting for secret rooms and stuff. So we like extra scouting chance. The thing that is also worth noting on the Ancestors map is the Trap Disarm. And you're probably going Shuffle. I already have a rogue here that has a bunch of Trap Disarm. Why do I need someone else? True, I hear you, but consider this. You have plus 10% stress on this, and then also Grave Robber constantly going into stealth, which means uh, the Vestal is going to be taking the brunt of stress nuke attacks. So, all she has to do is get hit by one of them, and then like the way the AI is going to operate is it's going to favor her more and more. So she's oftentimes going to be the first one to hit 100 stress in your party. The Trap Disarm gives her, I think, like 85% chance to disarm traps in a Champion. Which is pretty good, which means she can be the one disarming traps instead of the Grave Robber and just taking like 8 stress off each time. You know, hopefully you hit like 1 or 2 traps in a run. And it's usually worth the gamble. So, it does help. So definitely consider that. The other thing you could do, honestly, you could stack like double healing trinkets and just have like plus nine or something on your uh, Divine Comfort. I don't think it gets that high, but maybe if you had Hippocratic. Um, but yeah, so you have that. Or, oh, there is! See, why well, I was always looking in the wrong area. Yeah, so there is a plus that. So you can definitely use this. Also, if you can't get the Slacious Diary, the minus 15% HP is pretty steep, but there are ways to offset it. For instance, you could use, uh, which one is it? This one, like an Overture Box or something else that boosts HP. Uh, you can consider Ancestor's Bottle, which, eh, yeah, like it'll work, you know? But otherwise, some healing trinket, some support thing, you can do double healing trinkets. Otherwise, I would say the map is the best secondary thing, or you could use the Ancestor's Lantern to reduce surprise chance. Um, I don't know, I'm looking at that, maybe I'm just showing it off. But there's a lot you can put there. So, I've been talking a lot about trinkets for a character that is not focused in this guide, so I'm gonna shut up. Grave Robber, I'm only gonna talk about her quirks. Uh, the rest of them, you'll just have to wait for the, the appropriate guides, but pretty much whatever seems intuitive. Like I said, they're always good general picks for any character, but for the Grave Robber, my first quirks I'm looking at are anything that boosts speed. Usually you want Luminous because it's just better than Quick Reflexes, but if you can get Quick Reflexes, do that. And then next, we're looking at any Melee damage helper, so Slugger, Precise Striker, those are usually the best ones you're looking for. Uh, natural Swing, yeah, I'm not too big a fan, because her melee moves have okay accuracy as is, so don't really need them. Otherwise, you're looking for, as I said, extra damage, extra crit. Consider Deadly, because she does two damage types. Deadly gives you flat 2% crit chance. Pretty good, we like that. Moving on to... A third quirk to lock in, something defensive. Right? I wouldn't lock in both speed quirks, I'd just pick one. And then I'd probably take one damage quirk and then one defensive one. So one defensive one would be unyielding if you're afraid of her dying. That puts her up to 77% death blow resist, which is pretty good. You can also slap a martyr seal on there if you think she's gonna be riding death door constantly. Or tough. And I guess hard skin. I'm not too big of a fan. I think hard skin gets better if you have more HP. So having 33 HP, I would rather take tough over hard skin, but those are things you can do. Yeah, I mean, you can do things like clotter and whatever the blight resist one is too, if you really want to, but I think unyielding and then tough are the two best defensive ones for her. And then my phone buzzed again, but yeah. Then if you can't find anything else, then just double up on uh, one of the other ones. Now there is a sniper variant of this team, which is pretty much the same thing, but instead of like unerring and no instead of slugger and precise striker you get the uh the range version so you get eagle eye and unerring to boost your your range damage and then you swap out the letter opener for something like a musket ball or a lucky talisman or i guess a sickening satchel if you have not like if you don't have anything really good yet that doubles up on stuff which is actually kind of nice uh there's other things too like the ancestor's candle or in a crescendo box. There's a lot of things that just give you flat damage. So you can like double dip your damage types. But I like the extra crit too. But it's pretty much this team, the same things apply. You Shadow Fade, you Blight, you Stun, you Iron Swan, and then 
you throw daggers at stuff until you feel like you're safe, and then you lunge on like the last turn. Lunge is usually good to have in any Grave Robber build, just because, for one, it fixes positioning, and then two, it's a high damage finisher. Like, even without bonuses, it routinely hits around like 20 damage. So, it's still okay to clean up with. Uh, but otherwise, you can swap also for flashing daggers, and then just like Shadow Fade into flashing daggers, get some range damage, cleave that way and stuff, so. It's pretty flexible on how to play this team, which is why I like it so much. But that's another way to play it. If you want to play it also with the range damage, you can do something like putting in a Bounty Hunter, and you could like Shadow Fade and then Bounty Hunter marks, and then you do stuff that way. Bounty Hunter gets synergy with the stuns off uh, Hellion, so you can use Finish him. Or uh, also the, I forgot, the, the Vestal with Dazzling Light. So Bounty Hunter gets some synergies here too but then also gets Mark. Uh, but if you're gonna Mark, I would probably use a different team. But, you know, for, like, let's say you just really wanna have Mark and throw daggers, so that's something else you could use. And then there's other things you can start swapping around for. Like, if you don't wanna use Hellion, you could use, like, Man at Arms, and you could use Guard and Bolster and all the other buffs and stuff, but that's, like I said, I don't feel that they're as effective as the Abomination version, so those are options. If you really want to, but I would consider the Abomination Hellion the uh, the best setup. Something I forgot to also mention about the Blight team that we were talking about. This is another way to run it. With these characters, I've done it before. And the more I play it, the less I like it. The reason being, there's no stun. Like, there's no reliable access to a stun besides the Vestal. So people get hurt on this team pretty easily when you start playing in a Torchless... So I stopped using it, but like at highlight, you know, like a normal run, this is actually, it's fine. Like this will trash through hallways and put down a ton of damage. Cause you have like Impale, which is busted. It's everyone and blights them. So Grave Robber can pick whoever the hell she wants. Then you have Highwayman who puts down a ton of damage. And you have a Vestal cause why not? And uh, the only tricky part about this team is getting it to move correctly because Sometimes you have speeds that come out in weird angles. And you have to make sure that if the Highwayman's going first, that you play it uh, this way instead. Because you're going to Shadow Fade back here. And then on Highwayman's turn one, you want to point blank so you can impale on turn one again and then lunge. And then from here, this team gets kind of weird because you have to like be uh, trying to reset it. You know, like you can Shadow Fade again. And then point blank again or something like that or uh use what is it pierce yeah so this team is cool but uh what i was trying to get at before is that you don't need this crazy dancing team like this is something that would be that where people are constantly moving constantly doing stuff and every turn is like a new day where you have to consider what's happening and when you're playing darkest dungeon i kind of compare it to action RPGs in a way where if you've ever played an action RPG like Path of Exile, Diablo, and all the other things that fit in that that vein of stuff you want to be like really efficient to the point where you're just chewing through content without really having to think until you hit like a boss or some like tough enemy and it's kind of the same way in Darkest Dungeon you want your team to be a well-oiled machine where the enemy has minimal chance of disrupting it where you don't really have to think about your turns too much besides like your general strategy. So that's why I like the Abomination Hellion team. It's like, it doesn't matter what I run up against, like 95% of the time, I'm going to Shadow Fate turn one, I'm going to Poison, I'm going to Iron Swan or Stun. And then next turn, I'm gonna Iron Swan or Stun and Lunge and Stun with Abomination and Heal or Judgment. You know, like I'm doing the same things against every composition. So this team is more trouble than it's worth for the most part, but it is kind of fun if you're looking for something that's like highly mobile. And it does put down a lot of damage. That's the one thing it has over the other team, is it puts down a lot of damage very quickly. It just doesn't have stuns, so it's made of paper, basically. Okay, so this next team is a pick build. So you're sitting there going, Shuffle, I don't want to Shadow Fade, I don't want to Lunge, I don't want to think that hard. I just want to like, you know, press pick because it's a cool weapon, and just do stuff. Okay, so I got you. This build, I would still play it with Grave Robber up front. 
And, uh, you know, before I was saying you don't want to put her in front of Hellion. You still don't usually want to, but you can get away with it unless you use some other tank up in the front, like a Crusader or Man-at-Arms or something like that. But this is still okay. And so you Shadow Fade, and then you hit Pick for like 25 damage. That's why I like it. It's pretty cool. But if you don't want to do that, Pick, you might be saying like, well, the Leper, you know, does some fatty damage too. Like, why do I need to uh, Armor Pierce and stuff like that? And sometimes the protection values just get so ridiculous on certain enemies, like uh, the ones that can, what you call it, the ones that can uh, guard other characters and stuff, that they'll be sitting at like 60-70% protection, and Leper's just doing diddly squat against that, so even with the minus damage penalty, the armor piercing is why you want this move, and it's still fun to use, and it's the front too, and so... You have a normal melee setup, so consider what we were doing before with the, the lunge build of, uh, you know, Slugger, Luminous, Unyielding, or Tough, those things. Those all work. Those are all good. Those are our quirks. That's your quick, your quick quirks. The QQs. The crying. But this build, so you have Pick, Lunge, and Shadow Fade potentially, just because this still fixes movement errors, and Lunge still does more damage than Pick, and it hits more things. Then you have Throne Dagger for coverage. You don't need Poison Darts because you have Pick. So the reason you want Poison Darts or Pick is to get through Armor, but now you have Armor Piercing. And then this is one you could use Trickery on if you really wanted to, because she's not gonna be Shadow Fading, so she's gonna be in, in the open more often. So being able to protect yourself with more dodge that is not Shadow Fade is okay. So this is pretty easy. You just leave her there, you slam Pick, you throw Daggers. If you don't want to use Shadow Fade and Lunge, which I would still suggest, you can put on Flashing Daggers and Trickery, but that's kind of what I was saying before. It's like, you're going to be hitting this button and probably this button, and that's like, if you have this button, it makes that button. It makes Poison Darts irrelevant for the most part. And you have Throw Dagger. Why are you going to Flashing Dagger when you can Throw Dagger? Um, even though actually this isn't too far behind. Hmm. Interesting, I didn't notice that. Because this is still minus 10% damage, which, which does suck. But this is minus 33% damage. But this should be more DPS regardless because of the crit modifier. But, uh, yeah. But it's interesting to know the Flashing Daggers isn't that far behind. Hmm. Anyway, I feel like this is still the best loadout for this. Uh, Highwayman can do whatever the hell he pleases because he is just that good of a character. You can use the Duelist Advance and the Point Blank, which does kind of hamper the Iron Swan, so you usually want the first thing dead. So like turn one with this team would probably, probably, having trouble with words here, probably be Iron Swan and Throw Dagger, which would kill the fourth thing, unless the Hellion just one taps it. And then you're safe to Duelist Advance after that. Basically once the fourth rank thing is dead, you don't have to worry about Hellion's positioning unless you have, like, Battle Trance. So you can still do it. It gets kind of clunky. Uh, if you wanted to swap it out instead, you'd use, like, a... No, there you go. You'd use a Bounty Hunter. Like I said before, there's a lot of synergy here. And basically, you just want to gank the thing in the, the back, the fourth thing, and then hit stuns, and then start slamming picks on uh, the frontliners and take those down. And then, at some point, you start trying to clean up the rank 3, so probably throw in more daggers, but it's basically just when you get to the end of the fight, instead of like spamming poison darts and having to juggle around with shadow fade and lunge, you just start hitting pick. Because most enemies in the front line in Darkest Dungeon have armor, so it could be something low, it could be like 15 or 20% or whatever, but uh, a lot of the tanks sit up front, so pick to the face is a good move for that reason. If it hit the rank 3 thing, it would be like, phenomenal, just because of the coverage, so, uh, if you really want to, like, turn one throw dagger on top of Iron Swan, kill the fourth thing, lunge up, Shadow Fade afterwards, and, like, start hitting picks, like I said, Shadow Fade into pick is still really good, so I like that, uh, your other characters, I forgot to outfit the Bounty Hunter, so, let's look at the Great Robber, so same setup, this covers, like, all your melee stuff, which is why I like it so much, 
Uh, you could use Deadly also if you need some split damage quirks, but yeah. So we have Letter Opener, which gives us positive damage on pick. We're plus uh, 10%, and then also has a little bit of dodge, and then plus accuracy, which pick does not have as much accuracy as lunge, so the extra bonus is helpful. The Hellion, same thing, Hairpin, some other whatever the heck you want last, or other trinket, so Mark of the Outcast is pretty good. Uh, stun trinket, good. Melee damage, good. So like Ancestor's Pen, good. Really good, actually, because you could have around 40% chance to crit the backliner, the rank 4 dude. So we like that. The Vestal, I just put things on to show you just different things in the trinket slots. Like, these are pretty easy to get over time. Like, you could get this in a Blood Moon playthrough, somewhat reliably, and you're sitting at 38 HP, which... The reason I put this on is just to show you what she's going to be at if you use this. But that's a lot of extra healing. That's almost 60% extra healing. Like, this would put Divine Grace up to, like, what would that be? Like, 13 to 14 or something? And then this is up to 6 to 7 or 6 to 8, depending on what the breakpoints are. Maybe 7 to 8. Whew, that's fat. <laughs> so, there's that. And then the Bounty Hunter. I like the Hunter's Talisman. This is pretty easy to get early. I always feel like I find this reliably in my playthroughs. And then something else. You could use Agility Talent if you really want. Uh, wounding Helmet, anything that boosts damage. Vengeful Kill List if you're doing Caltrops. That's the other thing. There's a lot of rank 4 gankage on this team. Because you have uh, Iron Swan, you have Throw Dagger, you have Caltrops to like, boost all the damage back there. So this can take down someone that sits in the back really easily, like the the Hag, for instance. It can do pretty well against... Uh, and some other bosses, I don't want to give like too much away. You could reliably put some other support trinket on this character, if you really wanted to. Like, if you wanted to have your Ancestor's Lantern and your Ancestor's Map from like another character, you could stack those, or some other trinkets. Some other mid-tier stuff, if you really wanted. Uh, da -da 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 -da. You know, some kind of Slayer Ring, like Manslayer, Beast Slayer, Eldritch Slayer, those are good. Uh, Moon Ring, not bad. I'm just trying to go through the, the lower tier stuff. Defensive Trinkets, Blood Charm, fantastic, that was one of my favorites. Uh, Camouflage Cloak, the penalty isn't that big of a deal, because there aren't too many stuns. And if you're playing in Highlight where everything's a little safer, there you go. Uh, you can do, d -d 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 like, anything that boosts, like, bleed chances or... You know, surgical Gloves, these are really good to get early, I forgot about those. You can put that on. Like, that's almost a... Uh, like, you know, it's got these two penalties that aren't that big of penalties, depending on who gets it. Like, this would be really good on the Grave Robber early, if um, you can't get, like, a letter opener. I forgot about this, so yeah. Interesting trinkets in your lower bracket of stuff. Obviously, Dazzling Charm, anything that stuns, Snake Oil, Speed Stone, so you get the idea. Just uh, pretty easy to get a Hunter's Talisman early, and that covers a lot of your bases. The penalty is not that big a deal. Just something on top of it. Also, I forgot to talk about this. If they're, if you are unable to get an Ancestor's Map early, you can get it early. I'm not going to really spoil how you can get the damn thing because I mean I think people, like people that have gotten it, know how to get it, and uh, they know how you can get it early. But for those new players, if they don't want how to get those things, I won't tell you, but the survival guide is a great option early. Like, this thing is fantastic for a common trinket. Like, the minus one speed is whatever, so if you can't get the Ancestor's Map, use the survival guide. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can just throw that on there along with some other stuff, but this team does okay. You can mark if you want to throw some daggers at first, and... You get some coverage with, like, where you can reach. Bounty Hunter's really flexible. But this slot is probably the most open for this kind of thing. Arguably this, too. Like, this, as I said, could be uh, a Man-at-Arms, for instance. I don't think it's anything else, but... Yeah, basically, she's pretty independent here. I guess that's the whole point of this, is she doesn't have to be set up anymore. Like, she can Shadow Fade into Pick, and that's her own setup. She doesn't need Blight that much. The mark is nice. I forgot that it's a higher scaling than, than Blight Damage. But yeah, it's pretty much just hit and pick. Trying to gank backliners. And this is a way to player that is moderately successful if you want to do that. 
Um, but I still think the lunge build is better, and we're gonna move on to our last team comp. star is born. Champion falls. You know, I keep having these thoughts when I go to start talking about another team. That uh, I go, well, you know what? Let me check my notes a second time because I do have a huge thing of notes that I'm looking at. And then uh, I go, oh, there's this thing I missed. And whatever. I think the Houndmaster could be really good here too. The reason being, the Houndmaster has a lot of reach with the the Blackjack. You have a way to mark, the best mark in the game, in my opinion. Surprisingly not the best mark for the Grave Robber, because she has armor piercing. But otherwise, this is still the best mark in the game. I mean, not even just for the... Okay, so look at this stupid mark, okay? It does protection, which is the best thing to lower. Let me see someone else real quick. Yeah, so it does protection, which is the best thing to lower. It also has a 170% base chance. And if you look at the, was it the Bounty Hunter? His gives him speed, so you could argue that that's good in its own way, but less protection bonus, or yeah, less protection penalty than 140% base. We look at the, uh, where is it? It is this one. Yeah, then we look at the, the Occultist. His does damage. That's kind of cool. But also, it lowers dodge, which isn't as good. And it's got 140% base. I'm not even gonna look at the Arbalest. The Arbalest mark is so trashed here. But yeah. So this has a cool name, that's why I left it. But you could switch this and then lose the cool team name for a Hellion. This way you have some stuns, more stuns. You have a ton of reach. You have a stress healer too, which he can't do it here. He can heal himself, I guess, right? That's okay. But you have some you have a bunch of reach on everything. So this is actually a pretty good Warren's team because that's where I think the uh, Houndmaster does best. But you have protection lowering for other characters, which is nice. You have a lot of reach. You have bleed. You can put more bleed on with this team. If you wanted to, you can use flashing daggers to help bleed sticks. There's some sudden synergy that exists here. But then also, as we were saying before, the reason we kind of like the Man at Arms in a team like this too is because the Grave Robber, if she's not shadow fading, you want to protect her. And then you have a guard. So there's only, I think, two characters that have guards, so it's this and Man at Arms. And that's something to consider. The Houndmaster has the same base dodge of 30 as the, uh, the Grave Robber. So you can just tap guard and you get up to 50. And then you put on other stuff to give guard, or not guard, uh, dodge percentage. Which is pretty nice, I think. Not this, doesn't he have? Yeah, this. If you really wanted to, if you wanted to have a dodge tank, you have a protective collar, you can guard, you'd be up to 62% dodge before anything else happens. You have the weighted cudgel if you wanted to do it. You'd use this Crimson Quartz set, which is amazing. Or you just use the evidence of corruption. Like, you don't need... This thing is good. Like, on its own. It's crazy. His set might be one of the best because they're both good independently. And they're actually pretty good together. So, but if you put both this on, then we're talking more about the Houndmaster, and we're trying to, we're trying to talk about the Grave Robber here. So, yeah, this gives us a ton more scouting, right? We have the Ancestors map, 
Like, if you look at this, we have... Um... God, I'm just going overboard with this team right now, aren't I? Maybe this should have been the focal point. So if we see here, we have 25% base scouting. That's just what it is in the game. Then we have plus 15, so that's 40%. We have plus 25, that's 65%. And then we have plus another 25, which is 90% scouting. Holy sh... Like, this would be pretty good in, uh... Sorry, I just... When I... When I swore, I was like, is YouTube going to knock out my money? I don't know. But yeah. So, uh, you have 90% scouting. That's amazing. That is so good. You could use that in darkness easily. Like, it doesn't even matter. It's so good. But yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of good stuff going on here. So, Houndmaster could also work. Now we're going on to our last team. So this last team is kind of spicy. I got the idea actually from the Highwayman. So I had a user on my third tier list video named One God One Fury, and they told me that Grape Shot is actually really good if you pair it with a Gunslinger Buckle. And I thought about it. I normally don't like cleave moves, as I've been saying before. In case you didn't see the other parts of the video, a cleave is anything that hits multiple targets. So you see, Grape Shot hits one, two, and three. So I was thinking about it. And they're saying that you have the Gunslinger Buckle, which gives us plus 20% range skill damage. And that puts this to minus 30%, which is pretty good, because Highwayman has ridiculous damage at 9 to 16. I still don't know why that's allowed, but whatever. So I was thinking about it, and then when I was looking at Graveshot, for some weird, ridiculous reason, it has a debuff that gives you crits receive chance. And when I started looking at that more, I was thinking, huh... What can I actually do with this? So, this is how this team came to be. I was thinking about what are other cleave moves in the game. You know, if you really wanted to, you could, uh... I'm just put an occultist in there. Why not? Get out of your freaking Vestal, we've seen enough of you. I was thinking, like, how else can we make this work? So, the Grave Robber... not Grave Robber. The Grave Robber capitalizes on this team pretty well. But the Highwayman is, I think, the focal point. So you have people that can cleave. So, actually, let me set this up real quick. Okay, so as I was saying, the Highwayman is the crux, but we took other people that can capitalize on cleaving. So we have the Leper, rare Leper sighting, so you Leper enthusiasts that constantly blow me up in the comments, like, actually, Shuffle, here's why he's the best character. Also, why is he better than the Grave Robber? And I've had this debate several times. The most notable being I had someone that dropped into my Discord, um, like a week ago, and they just wrote me an essay about the leper, and then left. <laughs> they didn't even let me respond, they just left after they said it. <laughs> like, ah. Anyway, so, the, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, okay. I'm all frazzled, so. We have the Grave Robber with this setup. That's where I was at, okay. You could use sh uh, Lunge if you want. There's a couple reasons, as always, to fix positioning. But we'll talk about some other stuff, why not? Okay, so, Flashing Daggers is your core ability. This is a cleave, it hits ranks 2 and 3. If you're noticing, we're starting to see uh, the pattern here. This hits 1, 2, and 3. The Leper hits 1 and 2. Grave Robber hits 2 and 3. So we have one person that hits all 3, and then 2 hit 2 each. So everyone gets targeted, except for rank 4. But then also rank 2 gets hit by everyone, so rest in peace rank 2, you're going to be getting clobbered by 3 people. Uh, it's going to be pretty funny. But yeah, so we have Shadow Fade, we have Throne Dagger for coverage, because we do need to hit those backliners. And then, same reasoning before, we don't have Pick, so we have Poison Darts. You can use Pick in this build. Usually want your uh, Leper up front, just so he's the least likely to get pushed out of position. But, uh, if you wanted to rock it like this, I would suggest considering pick. So that way we can shadow fade into pick, but we want to shadow fade into flashing daggers. So, if you did the pick variant, you take off poison dart, so it would be shadow fade, flashing daggers, pick, 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 pick. Or flashing daggers second time, and then pick afterwards, throw daggers, those kinds of things. Okay, so, the leper... You can do pretty much whatever, 
Uh, you can use Chop and Hue. I think you need both of these, obviously. Uh, you can use Revenge if you're going to be in a long boss battle, but I would suggest against that for a cleave team. And I probably should have said this at the start. This team is great for smashing hallway battles and room battles. This is great for not boss battles. There are some bosses that have multiple things with them, like multiple things. It's not just one person in like a rank, you know, they have like allies or whatever. So revenge or this team can be pretty good against that. So that would be an example of uh, you could steamroll the hallway battles, the room battles, then get to the boss, and then you just tap revenge, and then this team could still work. So it's definitely good in that regard. But otherwise, you have... You could use Purge, but that's why we like the Occultist here. We'll talk about him in a sec. You can probably already guess. Uh, Cell feels really good, but it's basically these two. Probably this one, if you're going to use the Occultist, because healing's going to be a little light. And then your choice of... Fourth, you could do Intimidate. It's not too bad. You can use the buffs. Those are okay. Purge is okay, but the reason we like the Occultist is because we have Damon's Pull, which clears corpses. So that's why. This way we still have a healer with our weird reconstruction. We have a debuffer. This can be pretty nice because some of those prod enemies sit up front. This way we can drop their protection and kill them easier. Also, the Occultist is a slower healer than the Vestal, so lowering incoming damage with Weakening Curse very good. So that way, that's less time we have to spend healing. You know, maybe instead of getting hit for, you know, 10, we get hit for 8. It's not too bad. Just lower amounts. Always helpful. And then Occultus also has his own cleave, if you want to keep up with the theme. But then you have some other stuff too. So vulnerability hacks you don't really need because we're not marking. Then sack stab, we're not uh, in rank 3 with the Occultus. So I think this is probably the most optimal and obvious loadout. Okay. So what this team looks like is turn one, you Shadow Fade. And then you get to Grape Shot because Highwayman's pretty quick. And Leper's usually going last. This Leper is... <laughs> it's got quick reflexes and quick draw, so maybe not the best one to take on this team. But, yeah. So the goal is to use Grape Shot. And ideally, you want to stick the debuff. That's why I put the debuff amulet on. Just because I want to also show off some other trinkets. You can just roll damage or defensive trinket. Like, you can put whatever you want here. I think you need the Gunslinger's Buckle. You could use the Crimson Quartz set. I don't think that's his best. For this. Like, you have the 2 speed, the 10 dodge, accuracy crit, and then the mega high virtue chance, which we do like. But you can also put something else that puts down damage. You can use like one of the ranged ancestor trinkets or whatever, like any of the orange ones. Uh, da, 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 da. Isn't there? You can use like a moon ring, a sun ring, a slayer ring. Like I said, defensive trinkets. I know there's green uh, trinkets that do range damage. I just can't remember them off the top. Got range accuracy if you really need it. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do there but I think this is probably the best one because this way you get big damage off gunslinger buckle 15% accuracy is pretty good this thing desperately needs it uh, but also when you have the debuff thing you stick the debuff which is crits received so since you shadow faded on turn one your flashing daggers on turn two your crit chance is let's see so that's minus five so that's what 17 25. I'm really slow at the math right now. Hold on. <laughs> okay, so with all the math done, we're going to take away the quirk in the buildings. That's 15%. Plus 8, that's 23. Plus 8, that's 31. Minus 1, that's 30% chance to crit. Pretty good. Very easy for the Grave Robber to clean up one or both enemies that she's hitting with this move on turn 2. And then, since she's already going really quickly, she's very fast. So she's going near the start of the turn. Uh, the Highwayman's usually faster than the other Frontliners. I think 5 and 6 speed is pretty common. Something lower, sometimes too, like 4 speed in your uh, your Frontline enemies. But if you have Dismiss, he starts with Quick Reflexes. If you use the Crimson Court set, that's another 2 speed, de depending on whatever your Highwayman is. So, very easy to just chew through the Frontline within two turns. Like, they get 
one attack off each. Like, they get their attacks on turn one, they're dead on turn two. And if you get any crits, you're just down to, like, the rank four person. Rank four person is the stress dealer, often, you know, in most, uh, most cases. So, there is some inherent risk there, you don't have any stuns, but it is just fun to bulldoze stuff with this team. And the other reason that we like the the occultist is, let's say that stuff is dying, but you're not getting crits, so the corpses aren't getting cleared, and you need to pull stuff up to the front. Not only just for targets, but also you need to get the corpses out of the way so the leper isn't just completely shafted and can't hit anything. So that's why this has some good synergy. This team, as fun as it is, runs into some issues. Things it hates seeing is... R? Is. R. Things it hates seeing are two space enemies that like to sit in the front because those take up cleave slots. Like, you can't hew that and hit, you know, both halves of it. You have to just chop anything with high protection values because we don't have any damage over time effects, so... We're relying on some medium hit damage. You know, we're looking at 33%, 50% minus on our damage mods. So we're doing moderate damage. And we're trying to kill multiple things quickly, not one thing quickly. So this team can kind of run into trouble there if things have prot. Like if a lot of things have prot in the team or if there's a... Not really a guard. This gets through guard pretty easily. Uh, but yeah, if there's protection or double space enemies, this team can kind of not like, well, not kind of, it doesn't like that just because it neuters its effectiveness, which means that all we are trying to see in the dungeons are groups of four or three or whatever. Just think, just singular enemies that we can press all of our cleave buttons and enjoy watching them just die in two turns. So quirks you're looking for, the same things we were talking about with the other range build, you want luminous quick reflexes, so you want speed, you want unerring or eagle eye so you can get that range damage up we're not concerned with melee damage so we don't even want deadly most of the time just because like that's only if you're going to use this team exclusively because deadly can still be good uh, but otherwise we're going to be using flashing daggers that's it there's really no reason to use anything else besides flashing daggers and throw dagger and then some defensive quirks so as we were saying before unyielding tough those are both good so that said, I think that's all the content in the video, and now it is time to record an outro. Anyway, so if you watched all this, thank you. I really appreciate it. I know I talked a lot. Like, <laughs> I talked a lot, dude, and there's just big information dumps. So I'll try and have uh, timestamps and stuff to help people out, but... This character's really involved, and there's a lot of stuff that people... They just kind of, like, write her off. They go, well, her damage is low. She seems complicated. I don't want to deal with it. So I'm just not going to play her, you know? And I really like this character. I do think she's one of the best damage dealers. Like, I think she's behind Highwayman. And that's about it. So, she's definitely good. She's got her own things. But yeah, give her a try. Hopefully I convinced you to try a couple things and play her and stuff like that. And this, by no means, is like everything in terms of team comps for her and stuff like that. Like, I've, I've seen some ridiculous stuff of like the... Like I said, with lunging, I've seen... Well, I can't pick a second grave robber. We're going to pretend this one is. Like I said, there's been things like lunge, lunge, and this comes back or something like that. Then you lunge again, and then she just disappeared. So there's there's a lot of crazy stuff you can do with grave robber. Just whatever you feel like for imagination. And then the only thing that sucks is since she is kind of brittle, if you make a mistake or if your plan is just bad, like... You're gonna know, and she might, she might die. Or there's gonna be a death store or something like that, so. Uh, yeah, um, anyway, I just remembered I gotta record some audio fixes too, so I'm gonna do that right after this, but otherwise, thanks for watching. The other guides shouldn't be this long and in-depth, because most characters aren't this in-depth. And that's not to say anything about them, you know, like anything negative, but, like, I don't know, let's say I talk about, uh, Who's someone straightforward? Leper. Right? This video is gonna be like 20 minutes. It's gonna be talking about what the leper's good and bad at. A couple comps for him, but it's like... What are leper comps, right? It's just like, here's leper. And then just everyone else, I don't know. Yeah, so don't expect them to all be this long, so don't be worried about that. Which also means that some of the shorter ones I can put out quicker. 
Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the Shield Breaker in my Discord, which you're welcome to join. We talk about Darkest Dungeon and some other stuff from time to time. Um, it's like 50-something people now, which is pretty cool. Thank you, everyone, who's been joining. Uh, check it out. And I've been asking people what they want to see next, and I've gotten Shield Breaker a couple times for the second character. So Shield Breaker's next, and that's going to be another in-depth one, I feel like. And then after that, I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe like a cultist or something. Or, uh, maybe I should do Crusader, because people don't think Crusader's S-tier and all that. And they're fine to think that, but maybe I need to talk about him. So, that's where I'm at. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you want to see. Uh, people have been giving me a lot of good video ideas, too, not just, like, class guides. They've been like, have you wanted to do mod classes and stuff? And it's like, yes. Yes, I do. That's fantastic. So, I'm going to do that. I'm going to move into some guides on, uh... What is it? Base building and Blood Moon and stuff like that. Uh, darkness, all those things. So there's a lot to talk about in this game. I'm going to try and put out videos a little quicker now that my schedule is a bit more under control since, you know, first couple weeks of school is always the toughest. And I need to use the bathroom, so I'm going to end this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Join Discord.